The 1980s is the worst decade for music, or at least some people think it is. Others think it's the greatest. What can't be denied is the rapid development in technology that led to an explosion of new genres and styles, and the rise of the music video and MTV transformed how music was consumed. So what goes into creating a 1980s hit song? Can you even define such a thing? Well in this video I'm going to dive deep into two very different songs to see if we can learn the secret. Let's start with a song that is only just from the 80s. Echo Beach is a song by Canadian group Martha and the Muffins. Written by band member Mark Gain, it was released as a single from their album, Metro Music, in 1980. It features a classic guitar riff intro, which you just heard. There's also upbeat, danceable bass lines, and even a sax solo. Hear Mark Gain and the two Marthas talk about the origins of the band's name. Martha is a fairly unusual name. Do you find it confusing having two Marthas in the band? They always say, oh, you're Martha. And I have to explain, inevitably, yes, I am Martha, but there is another Martha. <laughs> It's odd because there was I was the only one in the band at the beginning and Martha Ladley joined the band about six months after we had started and uh, it was just a coincidence that her name was Martha as well and that's what's led to the confusion. The muffin part of the name came in <laughs> because we couldn't decide on a name at all over the course of the summer that we were getting together. We had about two weeks to go before our first gig and ha a name had to go on the poster. There was a very heavy punk scene going at the time in Toronto and we weren't a part of that and we didn't like the sort of posing that a lot of bands were doing at the time uh, with punk imagery so we went the exact opposite and picked something that was really wimpy and Muffin couldn't have been any wimpier so we put Martha in the front of it and that's how it came about really. Echo Beach was the band's only significant international hit although they had other popular singles in Canada. The song has seven distinct sections, a BPM of 161 and is 3 minutes and 24 seconds long. I'll now take each section in turn so we can dive into the details behind this classic. Let's start with the iconic intro riff that I played at the beginning of the video. The guitar for the intro is dripping with a chorus effect. A chorus pedal is a guitar effects pedal that produces a shimmering, wobbly effect designed to replicate the sound of multiple instruments playing at the same time. I'll now show you the tab for this riff. I created it in Guitar Pro. There's a link in the description if you want to get a copy for yourself. The riff spans four bars and it plays a total of four times. For the first two it is played alone with some quiet organ in the background. Then it is joined by bass and drums before the pre-verse. The first bar uses the notes A, C, B, G and D. The opening notes, A to C, create a minor third interval. These are also the first and flat or minor third note in an A minor chord. As the initial A note is played open, it is left to ring out throughout the first bar. These two notes alone set the musical scene for the rest of the song, as we will discover later. The remaining three notes in the first bar are B, G and D. These are the notes from the G major chord, so our intro has so far spelled out A minor and G major chords. On to bar two now. This bar uses the notes D, A, C, G and B. So exactly the same notes as bar one, but in a different order. The bar is split into two phrases. The first three note phrase uses D and A notes. The third note is an octave of the first D note. If you play guitar, you will recognize this as a D5 power chord. The next three note phrase uses C, G and B notes. These are the first, fifth and seventh notes in a C major seventh chord. You can hear the dreamlike quality of the major 7 in this part of the riff. The riff then simply repeats again, with one difference. The final note in bar 4 is changed from B to an open G note. This makes the final arpeggio into a C power chord. So in terms of chords we've seen the equivalent of, we have A minor, G major, D fifth, C major 7th and C fifth. It's also worth noting that the intro riff contains no accidentals, that is sharp or flat notes. This short intro therefore points us towards the key of the song, A minor. Let's now look at the bass line for the intro. I created it in Hookpad. There's a link in the description if you want to get Hookpad for yourself. The 
baseline for the intro sets up a tag phrase that is used throughout the song. It only uses three notes, A, B, and C. The first note is A for a quarter note, and then five eighth notes. The rhythm of this features again and again in the song. You can see even in this 8 bar intro sequence that it features 4 times. The only other note to feature in this intro bass is D. Then at around 25 seconds into the song, we hear the pre-verse. The pre-verse is a short 8 bar section and only features once in the song. The organ sound is brought to the front of the mix for the first time. I'll discuss this more when we get to the verse shortly. The guitar switches to a more distorted rock sound here and begins to play A minor, G major, E minor, F and G chords. All chords are bar chords except for the open E minor. <laughs> You can see that I've labelled these as 1, 7, 5, 6 and 7. As discussed earlier, this is the key of A natural minor slash Aeolian. The reason for choosing A minor here instead of C major is the way the chord progressions and other parts of the song are structured. The chord progression starts on A minor and doesn't even feature C major. As you'll discover, the song keeps coming back to the A minor chord. This establishes A minor as the tonal centre of the song and makes it feel like home rather than C major. The intro riff and bass line also start on the A note and keep coming back to it throughout the song. Speaking of bass, here in the pre-verse it reprises the tag that I mentioned in the previous section. This also happens at the same time as we hear the A minor chord. This is another hint that we are at home with A minor. You can see that other than the bass tag over A minor, the bass simply follows the root notes of the underlying chords here. Let's now move to the verse and the first vocal melody of the song. The vocal melody starts with a pick up A note at the end of the pre-verse section. In total the verse melody only uses three notes in a limited range, A, C and D. Although the verse is 16 bars long, the melody is really just two bars worth that repeats four times. It mixes repetitive eighth and quarter notes. The first phrase using C notes and A are heard over the A minor tonic chord. These two notes are in the underlying chord, so there is little conflict between the melody and the harmony. In bar two, the melody descends down towards the A note, simply using root notes from the underlying chords. This is a great demonstration of how simple and repetitive vocal melodies can be while still being interesting and complementing the song. This is also the first introduction of the theme of the song lyrics and the reason behind the title, as discussed in this interview. Yeah, is there actually a place in Canada called Echo Beach? It doesn't exist to my knowledge. It was, it's um, quite a fiction really. It's just a, a, a state of mind. Uh, the song deals with a state of mind really that when one has a really lousy job you tend to go back to a place you've been that has been quite enjoyable and I think everybody has a place like that in their mind and that's really what the song deals with. During the verse the guitar plays a four bar sequence of chords that repeats. The distorted sound carries over from the pre-verse section and all of the chords are played as bar chords. <laughs> You can see that we only use four chords in this section, A minor, D major, C major and E minor. The verse chord progression is 1 major 4, 3 and then 1 major 4, 5. This is repeated four times. There's an interesting use of the major 4 chord, D major here. This is a borrowed chord from the parallel major key and a common technique for songwriters to use in minor keys. You are more likely to come across this idea with the, with the minor 5 chord being replaced with the major version, but interestingly here we hear the standard minor 5 chord E minor. In terms of what's going on in this major 4 chord, you are taking the standard minor 4 chord in the key and raising the flat or minor 3rd note up half a step to create a major triad. In this case that note is F sharp or G flat. This note is not in the relevant A natural minor scale and therefore adds a bit of tension and interest. The F sharp slash G flat note will also feature again when we get to the chorus. Let's now take a look at what the bass is doing during the verse.
As highlighted earlier, we start this section with the bass tag over the A minor chord. It then plays mainly root notes from the D major and C major chords in the second bar. The whole thing is then repeated again, but we have an interesting change for the final chord E minor. The bass line rises up to E, then B, and E an octave higher. These notes are the first and fifth from an E5 power chord. So the bass is playing an arpeggiated E power chord. This really stands out as it rises up at the end of the phrase and beyond the rest of the bass line. As with the chord progression, this whole section is repeated four times for the verse. For the first time, we'll now discuss what the organ plays. In the original recording, an ace tone organ is used with a flanger effect. You can see that this organ part is very similar to the bass line. It starts with a familiar sounding part over the A minor chord. This is another appearance of the bass tag. It then simply follows root notes of the underlying chords and repeats four times like the rest of the verse. This sounds great as a complementary part to the bass line, as you can now hear. If you listen to the original version of the song, you'll hear that the first two bars of the organ are much quieter than the second two during the verse. This allows the vocals to be clearly heard. It also provides a nice call and response feel to the verses. Let's now have a listen to all of the parts playing together. <laughs> now we'll turn our attention to the first chorus, which starts at about one minute. Let's start with the vocal melody. The chorus is shorter than the verse at only 8 bars. As with the verse, there is a pickup note in the final bar of the previous section. We start on the G note and then simply ascend the A natural minor scale. In the first bar this means two eighth notes each on G, A, B and C. Then in the second bar the D note is played to end the phrase. This creates a fast paced, rising nature to the chorus. The excitement of the melody runs counter to the lyrics, lamenting the boring work that the singer undertakes. This first two bar phrase is repeated twice. Then in the second half of the melody the whole first half is repeated, but it starts on the A note. You could also think of this as being transposed up one step in the A natural minor scale. This continues the frenetic nature of the melody and the singer's longing for Echo Beach. Let's look at the chorus bass now. You can see that the bass is almost identical to the vocal melody, with the exception of a few steps down to smooth out the phrases. This increases the feeling of speed and excitement as the vocal melody and bass work together. It also presents us with a chicken and egg situation. What came first in the chorus writing process, the bass line or the vocal melody? Let's now have a look at the chorus guitar chords. <laughs> The guitar chords are very straightforward for the chorus, G major, D major, A minor and E minor. They are all played as standard bar chords. In Roman numeral terms the first half is 7 to major 4 and then 1 to 5. This is the second outing for the major 4 chord. The G major and A minor chords are played once and resonate, whilst D major and E minor are played more rhythmically. There's a split between the chord types, the first half of the chorus being all major and the second half all minor. The chords also help to show why the melody and bass target the notes that they do. The final piece of the chorus puzzle is the organ. The organ holds a note for a bar, then plays two dotted quarter notes before a quarter note. It follows along with the underlying chords, starting with a G note. Then as the chords change to the major 4, D major, we have the return of our old friend, the F sharp slash G flat note. This steps down from the G note and then alternates with the D note to provide a cool, interesting background sound to the chorus. As with the chords, the whole thing is repeated again before moving to the A minor chord in the 5th bar. Here the organ plays an E note, which is the 5th of the A minor chord. This has a darker feel as we enter the minor part of the chorus. Then over the E minor chord, the notes B and G are heard. These are the flat or minor third and fifth notes from the underlying chord. 
This provides a different vibe as we don't play the root note of the chord and leave the bass and vocal melody to take care of that. This provides some nice separation for the organ here. There are a couple of saxophone breaks in the song. Mark Gain, who we saw interviewed earlier, recalls this about them. Andy's sax solo is quite memorable. There's one little moment where it's almost off and there's some passing note, but it's so great. It's so idiosyncratic and he was a great idiosyncratic player. The thing with Andy was he would never play the same solo twice. He came out of a jazz background. That's where his sensibilities were. The improvised free form end of things. So he was very committed to trying to never repeat himself when it came to soloing. The second sax solo introduces another interesting chord. It's played as B-flat major here in the key of A minor. This is a flat two chord. The two chord in natural minor keys is a diminished chord, much like the seven chord is in major keys. Many songwriters seek to avoid diminished chords due to the tense, unsettling nature that they bring to a progression. Here, the flat two is created by dropping the root note of the two chord by half a step or semitone, and then building a major triad from this new root. You can also think of it as being borrowed from the parallel Locrian or Phrygian keys. You can hear the role it plays here, adding a great step up to the C chord in this escalator chord progression. This is also reflected in the bass of this section. Then we get to the outro slash coda slash refrain. Mark Gain even referred to this as the true chorus of the song. This lasts for about the last minute of the song. It uses the chords and bass from the pre-verse at the beginning of the song. The vocals repeat the refrain, Echo Beach, far away in time. This adds to the nostalgic feel of the song, as if Echo Beach is a mystical place in time that was better than the present. The melody has a nice, wistful feel here. Again, it doesn't stray from the chord tones, but it avoids the root notes. This runs against the root notes of the bass, providing a nice setting for the song to sail away into the sunset. So we've had a song in the key of A minor with a sax break. Is this the secret to the 80s? Let's move to the middle of the decade to learn about another big hit. I asked my community for songs they'd like to learn more about and had a range of responses. One answer that stood out was Tears for Fears. I'm a fan of many of their songs and thought it would be enjoyable to analyse one of them. Having seen several people on YouTube look at Everybody Wants to Rule the World, I struggled to find many covering their massive hit, Shout. So here we are. A deep dive into Shout by Tears for Fears. It was the second single from their studio album, Songs from the Big Chair, released in November 1984. Featuring a repetitive hook and synth drone throughout, Shout is regarded as one of the most recognisable songs from the mid 80s. Co founder and main songwriter Roland Orzabal describes its beginnings. And I started programming the Lindrum with my favourite beats from other records like uh, Remain in Light and it just kind of came out of nowhere. It hit me, the chorus, but that's all it was. It stayed as a chorus for a long, long time, and I thought it would only remain as a chorus until uh, I took it into the studio and everyone said, nah, we've got to put a verse on that. The song has two main sections. The A section could be called the chorus, and the B section could be called the pre-chorus or verse. I'll now take each section in turn, so we can dive into the detail behind this classic. As discussed, section A is the chorus. The exact production and instruments change on repeats of the chorus, but the one thing that remains the same is the vocal melody. I'll present it now in Hookpad. There's a link in the description if you want to check out Hookpad for yourself. The melody only uses three notes, G, D and C. It starts on G in the first bar whilst the words shout are being sung. Then in bar two it rises up to use D and C. The note lengths are a mixture of eighth and quarter notes. Looking at the melody in isolation here, the song could be in the key of G major or the key of G minor. If I put some basic chords underneath the melody, we can listen to the difference in sound this would create. First up is the key of G minor with the one, six and four chords. And now the key of G major with the 1, 6 and 4 chords. So 
so we'll need some more clues to reveal what key the song is in. The meaning of this chorus has been debated since its release. In interviews, the band seems to indicate that it's a call to action, making your voice heard when you disagree with the way your world is heading in an effort to affect change. A coy reference to Primal Scream, but also just a simple song about protest. So you could see the transition, the slow transition from the personal perspective to a more social and political perspective and Shout is the linchpin because the big song that came after that was pretty much purely political sound season love. As the vocal melody kicks in we also have two other elements that make up the first part of the chorus. Firstly there's the programmed drums. Alongside this there is a simple synth bass that creates a sense of dread. The bass here is really just simple single notes that are held, but the synth doubles the voice and slightly detunes it. I don't have enough knowledge of synths to recreate it accurately here, but if you want the full lowdown, then check out the fantastic channel and website Reverb Machine, link in the description. Let's have a listen to the bass now. You can see that the bass notes are simply sustained for two bars each, and then change. They are G, E flat, and C. So only one new note is introduced here from the vocal melody, E flat. This rules out the possibility of the key being G major. This points us towards the true key of the song, G minor. Into the verse or pre-chorus now, and I'll start with the vocal melody. As with the rest of the song, we have nice and simple, repeating melodic phrases. Compared to the chorus, there's a little more variation, with the use of dotted quarter note lengths and the introduction of the F note. The highest note in the melody now becomes G, which is also the tonic note of the scale. These high notes hit before the end of the melodic phrases, which gives the key lines in the verse a real melancholy as they descend back down. The bass in this section has also made a change. It is more upbeat and rhythmic, alternating between B flat and C notes. There's also the introduction of an airy synth to the mix. This R1 sound is a recognisable choir sound that was popular with many 80s artists. Again, it uses a few notes simply, in this case, G, D and F. Once this sound comes in, it remains in the mix to varying degrees for the rest of the song. For the second verse slash pre-chorus, we can hear the first outing of a live instrument. A clean electric guitar is heard playing simple B flat major and C major chords that follow the bass line. In Roman numeral terms, this would be three to major four, which is a borrowed chord from the parallel major key. Here they are tabbed out in Guitar Pro. Follow the link in the description to grab a copy of Guitar Pro for yourself. And here I am playing them. This is another part in the gradual layering up of the song. Now that the clean guitar has featured in the verse, it is introduced to the next chorus at 2 minutes and 10 seconds. This time a funky rhythmic set of double stops played on the B and E strings. This uses chromatic notes from outside of the G natural minor slash Aeolian scale. And they only feature briefly, as sometimes the guitar plays rhythmic muted strings where the A and E notes would be heard. Listen to them in this example, along with the slide from fret 1 to fret 3. The song takes an interesting turn around 2 minutes 43, with an extended instrumental part, 
or section C. It starts with a change in percussion and a repeating riff that uses G, F and B flat. As Reverb Machine noted, it's comprised of layered up samples working together to create an interesting Middle Eastern sounding section. This is due more to the pitch gliding nature of one of the layers rather than the simple notes being played from the G minor scale. Then we hear an organ solo part followed by a bass solo. Despite a real bass featuring in the music video, and Roland Orzabal and Kurt Smith both able to play the bass, it is actually created with a Yamaha DX7. This was another popular synth during the 80s. Then we crash back into the chorus with added backing vocals. And then an altered verse slash pre-chorus, another chorus, and then a guitar solo. The guitar solo strictly uses the G natural minor slash Aeolian scale. It provides a real cut through towards the end of the song, injecting drama and some great melodic lines. I'm not going to play the whole solo or tab it all out here, there are other brilliant creators who have done this on YouTube already, but I want to highlight and discuss a couple of interesting parts of this section. The first part of the solo mimics the riff heard with the airy choir synth detailed earlier in the video. Then the part that really grabs my ear follows. The mixture of note lengths here and descending down the G minor scale towards the tonic creates a dynamic skipping riff that features throughout the solo. Then the solo moves on to an intense higher note with lots of vibrato and a smooth high line that leads back down to the skipping riff we discussed. We then go into section A to fade. The ending choruses have all of the parts, including a continuation of some solo riffs and some extra backing vocals. This creates an epic, big sounding crescendo to the song. We can't draw any conclusions about an entire decade from two songs, but both songs use minor keys and have a yearning to be elsewhere. So how can you recreate this 80s existential dread for yourself? You need to be able to write minor key songs, which I'll show you how to do in the video on screen. Watch that now to head back to the 80s.